Crawling into the blue tent at dusk, a kookaburra mob explode into thick vocality. This detonation has a psychedelic effect. I feel an alarmed delight at the utter place of this place. By day we are eaters and soil makers, children of magpies, among the many motley solsters in Mother Jarra country. At night I am sacred fear besetting forest, part clear eye night forager, part rapturous hunter body of water. Night evokes a kind of state in which politics has no dominion, no capital, no centre. A tent might stop me from being predated by insects, but it won't save me from being harpooned by a tree limb. Living in a tent is the handing over of certain securities for birdsong. Morning brings a man leaning out the window of a spotless municipal car, pointing an iPad at the length of grass in a neighbour's field our goats are trying to eat down before bushfire season. He states, a notice will be coming. It's a La Nina year, I respond. Grass keeps growing. Whose authority do we give agency in stolen land? Laying in the old tent, sleep rapidly approaching, I tell our youngest a story I did not know before its moment of utterance, of poet becoming hunter, hunter becoming forest. A child of the feralty, Blackwood hunts blackbirds for four and twenty pies. Jarrah old-timer birds have no wee second people menu. Only moments after the kookaburras have called away the day, a boobock is heard harbouring in night. A pobblebonk spills his drum, then spotting lone cries of roosting cockatoo in what will become an entirely autonomous song of night. My friend Dale MacDonald asked me to bring our goats down the gully he's been tending for two decades. You have Aboriginal permission, he says. You don't need the governments. This Gundi Jamara man calls goats European weed killers. We make a point to meet in the new year. Ravens keep showing up hopeful at the poultry coop. One picks up a day-old duckling and drops it at the screaming of a neighbour. Dale and I share heritages, common roots and stories. Moor, Agus, Beek, Brea, Agus, Gifritja. There is no Scottish nationalism here. States destroy true belonging. A land will call forth indigeneity. Scotch thistle roots bore down into compacted mother country clays and reach up into her light. There is transmission here of goodly mineral, water and ancestor. Almost all my Aboriginal friends share Gaelic ancestors with me. Is non-indigeneity a thing of mind or country? Will the biodiversity industry ever grow up past correct and incorrect species? Does my whiteness and gender cancel out this question being asked? Will we ever move beyond reductive politics? Can we grieve rather than point? Supremacist. Suburban depression requires many dogs unfenced and off leashes, daily bringing little dramas to our streets where neighbours gather for the commotion and share a yarn and some produce. The stillness of full moon gives over to scratchings outside the tent. A tent brings many insecurities, which in turn brings unexpected gifts. The thin veil between birdsong and body, 
much more than surround sound. In moonlit forest, a shard of old ceramic blinks another's brilliance. There is grateful softness in this acknowledgement. There is something about domestication that calls for eating all the troublemakers first. Rat bag goats in the freezer, anxiety about neighborhood roses, acute awareness that if I was solely a goat, I would have long been eaten. We have to wait for more neo-peasants to arrive before we can give up scarcity economy tools like freezers. In the neo-peasant near future, a goat will be shared at special feasts in frugal abundance. With one mob, the hosts here, another there, until all are giving into a six-season flow of gifts that make freezing meat redundant and in poor taste. In exchange for two small limbs of native cherry to burn at the men's fire circle, I let two mosquitoes draw my blood until they're full. Graced again by the dawn chorus, sleep washes back in, 100 droppings on my tent. Since returning from four days fasting, listening to Jarrah Mother Country, a quivering aliveness to my now naked fear is almost pleasurable. I return with a craving for goat brain broth and Meg's home fermented miso. Bliss is found in siesta. After the honoring and eating of lunch, sleep, love making, and the cold water plunge, the afternoon labors lead into preparation for dinner as a gentle wind picks up bringing leaf song into garden. Communal days in the home economy, fluid between people, dog and plants. Communal nights in the poetry tent with all and sundry dwellers of forest. With fading eyesight, a greater capacity to listen seems possible. This is where aging and darkness might find a shared habitat. For those of us trying to hold a narrative of ourselves in another's mind, we're always falsifying the evidence. Great numbers of Corellas have returned to country for the warm season, assembling in little mobs close to Grandmother Lake where they mass each dawn and dusk for a spectacular song and flight ritual. One household does not make community. The seed heads of fireweed grow abundantly among the sirens of tree creeper and the stranglings of ivy. If we're not deceiving ourselves that we're right, then we're probably living in multiple states of awareness holding complexity as sacred and suitably contradictory. Why rage against the bucolic lands our souls long to dwell within? Why dismiss this longing as archaic? The romanticization of progress is true conceit, but the love of land? Why in this dominant culture is our ego perennially at war with our heart? Our hearts only wildly sing in the company of trees, creeks and fields. For the rest of the time, they live small, dutifully pumping our daily bloods into the catastrophe, cyborgia. A literature of nonsense is a response to trauma when story is masked in absurd detour. In my moment of death will I say, I have no regrets. I have loved with my heart and attended to my ego's worst selves. I made an art out of conflict resolution, and although I made many enemies, wounded innumerable friends and two beautiful sons, and roared at those who I perceived as unprincipled, I eventually found an abiding love bundled in a discipline of humility, song and grace and a wildness that opened to white, serpent, dreamy. 
In more than token numbers, kangaroo grass grows with newcomer rye and vernal. Millions of tons of concrete are poured each year to make the world more safe. Fireweeds conceal the tent from morning walkers. Their dogs defecate along the path where the medicine mushrooms grow in midwinter. To decolonize a university requires its demonetization. This will occur once trees become professors again and staff become unsalaried gardeners of commons. Inside a mammal, pinworms can create a split personality where irritation is the overriding symptom. Some interbeing is best treated with diatomaceous earth. Capitalism is a code word for generational trauma. If this is how we fessed up to capitalism, we'd soon move beyond the controlled crying of the state. When the many professionals of modernity behold my feralty not as poverty, but as a deliberate opening to the many griefs of the world, they will sing naked and joy-filled in wood duck fouled water. There is a subtle line of discernment between self-care and self-indulgence but a bold line between eldership and narcissism. As farmless farmers, it is welcome relief to be offered land for grazing and browsing. Such an offering is never permanent and this is the true gift of such access. All the feral legumes are popcorning at this time of year. Sparrows are either ignored or loathed as common or incorrect but when they spring up through drying grass, dancing above the forming seed heads, they are astonishing and beautiful. Cowardice is the complementary state where violence is the capital. Permanent access to privatized land is a killing off of soul. All morning laboring at the community garden, all afternoon moving temporary goat fences on shared land. The vision of white serpent rising fills me with love for all futures. To come home from fasting with this vision is a true gift, honoured in a myriad of ways which include starving oneself of world news, the stories that keep us fixed in the shit that we can't but otherwise serve. Mosquitoes and tourists share similar qualities, both eat the sleep of neo-peasants. Martin Shaw is one of my first pupil teachers. He describes the moist ground of grief in which a treasury of gifts is contained. Francis Weller is one of my second pupil teachers. Grief, he says, is subversive, undermining the quiet agreement to behave and be in control of our emotions. It is an act of protest that declares our refusal to live numb and small. Some people can only use the word feral in a pejorative sense. Does the word wild even make sense in Jarrah mother country? How many of us were put through controlled crying? How many grew up being told not to get upset? While money puts us into diminished states of debt, gifts bring us gratitude for the heartfelt indebtedness we acknowledge for being alive, for the frugal abundance that is possible if we perform life with life in mind. Our politics are always hard because softness requires a composting of reductionism and an opening to subtlety and vulnerability. The culture we've become is not a true culture. Too many tin horns, not enough druids. Imagine if it was in the culture to ask, where does one go to make soil, instead of, where is your toilet? A participant of world gives to world, and as gift maker and gift bringer, understands the necessary acceptance of gifts. I'm not convinced my handmade envelope containing a child's drawing will make it through the prison postal system. White institutions don't seem to cope with anything left of goat fields or direction trees. On the stillest, starlit night, a tree will fall in the forest close to the tent I sleep in. I reach into my mortality and smile with acceptance. 
On another night, when sleeping beside my child in the same tent, I shudder with dread when the wind picks up. Does a wind ever rest? Do I ever rest? A goat will rest and there is much to learn from goats. The acknowledging and honouring of fluid, queer and shape-shifting kin, compliments, not counsels men and women kind. Men's business, women's business, queer business. I'm politically far to the right when I'm defending urbane judgments of our safeless neo-peasant lifeways. And I'm far to the left when I call out intransigence to Aboriginal sovereignty and governance. In the context of hard reductive politics, I'm therefore contradictory. Yet in the context of complex political relations, I'm at home in Aboriginal territory. Fairy wrens appear in the most sacred of places, but they don't come in robes. The empty shells of cicadas cling trunk and limb in dry Jarrah country. Cicada song and simultaneous micturation fills the sky with shrill and moist intensity. We will lose everything we love, declares Francis Weller. And yet in this sorrowful, sobering thought springs the gifts of lively presence. Some loss can be grieved alone but much needs to be witnessed and cried out together. The seismic grief of industrialization requires a billion small gatherings crackling across the world's worlds, where people gather to sing songs of the magic of trees. Like depression and anxiety, identity wars occur in the absence of grief rituals. Goats are novel thinkers, unsentimental, but not unfeeling. Founded by a chemist and a confectionist, Pfizer is the pharmaceutical company best known for bringing drug and lolly into the same pill. There is only a shrinking silence for those of us who know better to trust capital with our health and know well the speed of truth. It is everyone's business what we spend our money on. Otherwise, we'd be stealing from subsequent generations. Blessed is the resurgence of old-timer kangaroo grass when a friend rides his bicycle across town to deliver some early season apples in exchange for snow peas. My generation was the last to be beaten in school. After corporal punishment, schools found other more covert means for instilling compliance such as prescribing students the same line drawing to colour in. If in a moment of arrogance I had any advice to younger poets, avoid sending your poems to literary journals. Being accepted into these self-conscious dwellings will harm your words. Speak your poems out as little rituals into the ordinary magic of daily life. Your poems spoken at the scale of neighbourhood are elegant murmurings of your life as a perpetual student with forearms of moss and hands of hoof. Avoid literature courses for their human centricity. Even so-called post-human humanities will remove you from the grace-filled and blood-curdled biomes your poems will need to feed in. Know why you speak your poems. Know yourself. Hear the land's will from which your poems are spoken from. For these poems are not really yours, but a merging of souls, memory, coming together through words carefully chosen or loosely grubbed out of mother country in no means rational. Affluence slows down our ability to reculture to the next level. We'll see where we're all at in a few more years. To the woeful diminishment of the herd, our culture now vaccinates against the evil pathogens, inquiry, experimentation, risk. In many cases, to stay safe is living in a state of premature death. When we farewell loved ones, 
could we not instead say, live well? Poet as family, poet as neighborhood, poet as shit compost, as watery flesh, walking for the speech of things, collecting in many baskets of belonging the spores of such fruit falling back through the weave. It's no wonder governments are so committed to keeping people in cars when they receive a third of every dollar spent at the Bowser. Petroleum still lubes the economies of madmen. Green tech folk believe electric cars is the solution, but the endless streams of resources and roadkill continue to light up the morbid freeways of this fallacy. Corellas are the gloaming harbingers of Mother Jarra country. Their dusk cries are piercing cuts towards the night. Defunding banks, television, stadiums, universities, advertising and pesticide companies, big pharma and motorized transport ought to do it. Scientism draws the conclusion that things have never been better. Animism reveals the falsehood of such a romance with progress. Scientism draws the conclusion that not only have things never been better, but that every problem has a solution which only science can render into being. Animism draws the conclusion that things are no better or worse and that every entity has a soul which makes up a world of souls and only those who ignore their soul's place in such a weave of connection do untold damage in the worlds of the world. While scientism nourishes the ego, a soul is nourished by a community of unrepressed souls who give to one another. Nature is nothing but a stupid word. Shame has so many variants in our species. When things go wrong with the goats, I question domestication. On all other days, I draw on bucolic wisdoms of my ancestral goat herds and sing praise through my fingers into oily receiving necks and at the base of dry horns. My earliest ancestors are light particles, grains of salt and briny water. I am more pond than flesh, more microbe than human cell, more breath than cloth and more mammal than cyborg. I am more gift than greed. I am more mother than man, more forest than industry and more ungulate than city. While patterns help us form the world through our perceptions of them, it is magic that informs us most of our perceptiveness is asleep and our default modes are stuck in deeply gravitational grooves. Scientism is forever playing catch up with first people's understanding, but it doesn't possess the eldership or the rituals of honoring to put this knowledge into relationship with the living of the world. The collusion of science and industry drives us to the motorways of extraction and ruination. Such scientism believes the living of the world is named nature, something over there that you travel to on weekends in your Subaru. If we are to transition back to ecological cultures of place, we need to flip the social hierarchy. Vain modernity becomes the lowest rung. Second people reclaiming their indigeneity the second. First people renewing and reinstating their cultural practices, governance and sovereignty the third. And the highest rung, the one in which we all serve with deep care, gratitude and reverence, is first people who remain resolutely untrammeled, practicing rituals of return, rituals of ancestors, ceremonial songs, and offerings to the many deities of the world's many worlds. The slow swelling of pears are more than present in this season of bobblebonk foam and hoverflies. When midwives are back on top of the social ladder and come by foot to deliver our Stone Age children, who grow up on the wild and responding milks of their mothers and the milks of other women folk kin, 
when controlled crying is considered the cruel past. Fathers raise children in ecological knowledges and young people find their gifts through year-long rites of passage. Only then would we have risen up from the many generational traumas that keep us small, enslaved and anxious. Black cockatoos are the grace makers in this country. When they move between pines, they perform a sorrowful song. When they harvest from the tops of trees, this beautiful quiet calls for attention. The ripening of cherry plums marks the beginning of the feral fruit season. Harvesting by foot and basket along the town's scruffier roadsides becomes a spectacle for tourists and cobajis recently arrived in sparkling chariots, thumbing supermarket apps as they pass. We begin each fire circle listening to country. The grief that rises from the hearth on these nights generally encircles suppressed emotions. Few of us feel worthy. Most of us feel shame. We all pass through a threshold of feeling. Numbness abates for a short while. Do men ever get over the regime of controlled crying enforced on them as babies? Do any of us? In America, whether you are woke or militia, you think you're right. Instead of being right, is it possible to ask the other with deep sincerity, what happened to you? I want to learn from the many crows of ravens. I want to learn from my ancestral druids. All are here in my body psyche, my mythological psyche, my microbial psyche. All is here in the floodwaters of my being. My tears are as old as time and older still. There is no written record. Everything we need is held here in trees and rocks, mushrooms and birdsong. It is being spoken if we listen. This old Mother Jarrah country is older than people, older than rock, but not older than briny water. After months of cold and wet, the heat has finally arrived. Now, darkness is my foremost teacher, darkness and heat. I arrive at the tent barefooted just before the dusk burrows once more chant in the night. Each step slowly, presently taken at the speed of thorn. There are mouse droppings in my nest, a small hole chewed or torn through the wall. We are passing between realms, roosting birds and turning in feral men. Waking antichinus, possum and owl, we all roll across each other's grace and aliveness. Suburbia will wash up on the shores of deep yesterday. Cyborgia will leech its cancers for a thousand more years but no more be praised. Being rained on while urinating in a forest gives yet more context to the inseparable union of discomfort and pleasure. Is it too easy as modern subjects of capital to forget to thank the many gifts that fill our day and give vitality to it. A prayer is gracious acknowledgement and gratitude for the living of the world's endless givings. Who are we in prayer? As soil makers, our bodies take in gifts of the earth, transforms this nourishment via autonomous fermentation and returns to earth the gift of humanure. As biological composters, we are gift bearers. We return gifts to the living of the world. We are ass, gut, mouth, everything we need to ferment grand culture. At night in the tent, I must keep trusting the sight received through my mammal ears, for no pitchfork is required for a forest to tend its own soil. <laughs>